Hi, I'm Ben Grassi, and I'm a graduate student at University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Today, I'm going to go over a study I did using imaging and acoustic uh, survey techniques to uh, resolve and characterize a thin layer formation of the squat lobster, Plurincodes planipes. And so just generally, why am I interested in these sensor-based, these imaging and acoustic-based sampling approaches? Well, to, to examine and interrogate uh, the distribution and habits of animals in the water column, traditionally, you would use um, net toes. And, those techniques, you're integrating measurements over relatively large um, space and time scales. It's much larger than the variability that exists in the environment and the heterogeneity often in their distribution. And so with these um, in situ sensor-based systems, you're, we're able to look at, um, at the distribution of animals at scales that really match um, the environmental variability and their variability. And we can much more tightly couple this to physical measurements. And you can also start to look at things like in situ behavior and individual level analysis. And so just a broad overview of the presentation I'll be giving right now. Um, so I'll start with some background on the sensor platforms that I use for this study, how I derive data from those systems for the analysis of this thin layer. And I'll show the results from this, showing the distribution and abundance and evolution of this thin layer over time and its relationship to the environment. I'll summarize these findings and go over some lingering objectives I still have from this data. And so we were doing field work offshore of Baja, California, uh, Mexico. So this is in the Austrian minimum zone in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Uh, and we were using a stereo camera profiling system built in my lab. So this was deployed um from the ship's uh tow cable and we were using it as a profiler as the ship sat position using its dynamic positioning system and so this is two cameras that we before going out in the field we calibrate we populate um camera models for them and the translation between the two that are looking outward from this um towed system and the system also has uh a suite of environmental sensors, so CTD, oxygen, and chlorophyll. And just briefly to outline um, the software that was uh, constructed to go from these raw stereo uh, sensor information to uh, relevant biological quantities. So with our raw images, these are affected by variable lighting due to both the strobe and as we profile through the euphotic zone. And so we do a two-step correction to generate a representation of the strobe lighting, the local ambient lighting, and decimate that out so that we're left with this neutral background. This facilitates the kind of classic image processing problem of image segmentation. So this is discretizing the salient regions in the image plane, i.e. the organisms themselves, and so kind of defining them. And those segmentation um, solutions are merged with stereo matching routines. So that is finding feature correspondence between the two cameras. Um, and that allows us to reproject these individuals back into the 3D sample volume. And so here's an image showing kind of a representation of that processing pipeline in brief. So on the left is an image from the left camera, on the right is the other camera. Um, these bounding boxes are bounding the segmented region. So here are these crabs in that thin layer. And those lines are connecting the features that were found to correspond. And so you can see the view we get from the stereo system as we descend through this really vertically compressed thin layer. And so from this processing, we are um, provided a library of these um, segmented regions, which are animals. And so we have the stereo pair library. And from that, um, I manually identified the, the squat lobster, um, which you can see is quite uh, differentiable from the other diversity of zooplankton that we resolved. Um, so a little background on this target species, Chlorincodes planipes. So this is a squat lobster, meaning it's a galliathid crustacean, not necessarily a crab. And it's enormously abundant in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And so it's really an important prey item for commercially valuable predators like tuna. Um, and they have both the benthic and pelagic phase that um, it's, it appears that they 
uh, later in their life history are exclusively benthic. But a lot of the, uh, a lot on their pelagic habits, their distributions, their fine scale vertical distributions, and their manners of migration and redistribution, and the relationship to the environment in the pelagic, it's really not well described. And so for this study, we also, in, in addition to the imaging system, we were also concurrently using uh, a shipboard echo sounder system. So this is a downward looking uh, system from the RV Sekuliak. It's a five channel system. So we have five different acoustic frequencies. And so to begin my results, I'll show you the abundance and distribution and evolution of that crab layer that we've resolved um, using the imaging and the acoustics. So here's a representative echogram from the ship um, echo sounder from zero to 400 meters in time on the x-axis. And this, this, the profiling path of the stereo camera system is overlaid as these white lines. So you can see we had a deployment at midday where we uh, had a single profile where we kind of parked and had a sustained observation at the thin layer. And then we did this repeat profiling that, um, that captured the day-night transition. And so, from the uh, imaging work, we derived actual abundances for the pluricodes. Uh, so this is in these bubble plots, that's abundance per image volume for these crabs from the, from the imaging system. And we're overlaying that on acoustic scattering volume uh, from the shipboard system. And so what you can see here, first, the, the abundance information from the imaging system really matched well to the scattering volume um, from the acoustics. And so our um, midday deployment, that is when this crab thin layer was at its maximum density. They reached over 80 individuals per roughly eight cubic meters of that imaging volume. Um, and in that repeat profiling, you see they're sitting on this oscillating um, portion. And what's really apparent is this rapid loss, this, in, this near instantaneous loss of that thin layer formation. They have a surface expression immediately after and an apparent descent. Um, and so the acoustics really help contextualize this event. Um, so this is kind of backing out, looking at an echogram, a larger echogram. You can see the crab thin layer here. And this is that moment of dispersal. And what the acoustics really provided is information on deeper scattering layers. So you can see here's a scattering layer um, that ascends through this crab thin layer, not uh, you know, and the crept in layers for still uh, maintained its formation. This deeper scattering layer, when it arrives at that depth band, that is the moment of dispersal. And so it's likely this dispersal is initiated by the arrival of that deeper scattering layer. Also, we see an apparent reformation of the crept in layer roughly two to three hours after that dispersal. Uh, and so from doing these kind of in situ studies, we also have this coupled environmental data. So that provided additional contextualization of this um, kind of community structure here. And so here I'm showing chlorophyll data um, overlaid on the camera profile. And these are contours of scattering volume to kind of show the overall scattering distribution. So you can see the chlorophyll maximum is above that thin layer um, and matches to this persistent scattering layer. Um, and these migrating scattering layers seem to uh, really have a nighttime uh, depth distribution about the chlorophyll maximum. Uh, kind of really, um, as we were looking through this kind of the physical data, what really stood out was when we looked at buoyancy frequency. So this is a measure of water column stratification. And what we, so what I'm showing here is again, crab abundance from the image uh, data overlaid as these bubble plots. And I'm showing buoyancy frequency plotted against density, not pressure, density. And when you do that, you can see that this thin layer is tracking this isopycnal, this 126 kilogram uh, to meter cubed isopycnal. And um, so there was an internal wave oscillating through this layer. And that's causing that oscillation in pressure land. And so um, Another, you know, we tried a number of smoothers and methods for the calculation of buoyancy frequency, which is sensitive. Um, and consistently, this um, isopycnal was a local peak in buoyancy frequency. It is locally stratified. So they're tracking that stratified peak 
another kind of neat finding was that so these profiles um, correspond to the dispersal of that migrating layer and the arrival of those deeper migrators. It looks like the fine scale structure of stratification in that zero to 220 meter depth band really is diminished during this event. And so that was kind of really neat and tantalizing to see. Um, so also, you know, this rapid migration event, we wanted to look at it in more detail. So using uh, behavioral information from the fact that we have an imaging observation and also using the acoustics to kind of beat out some of the um, identi uh, characterization or composition of the scattering layers. And so from the imaging, um, these segmented crab regions, I used aspect ratio, so height over width of these bounded regions to be a proxy for the individual animal orientation. So those with high aspect ratio were these vertically oriented individuals. So these were individuals that were doing this rapid escape response by slapping their abdomen shut um, and causing them to be vertically displaced. They're swimming vertically. Those with low aspect ratio have their pleopods out, they're buoyant, they're senescent, they're not swimming. And so using that proxy and setting a threshold for aspect ratio to define the swimmers, these vertically oriented individuals, we can look at the fraction of crab swimming. So this again is the uh, imaging abundance overlaid on these contours of scattering volume. Um, and you can see that, you know, in midday during that really dense formation, it, there weren't swimmers. It was a really stable layer comprised of these or horizontally oriented individuals. Um, this was true for the beginning of that day night um, repeat profiling. And you can see here's the scattering layer coming through here. Here's that deeper one. Seems like after that, as that first scattering layer comes through, we have an increase in um, swimmers above the thin layer, these smaller aggregations. But what really is interesting is after the dispersal, their maximum occurrence at this much shallower depth. Um, about 60 to 80% of those were swimmers. So they were really employing this rapid escape response to do this really rapid vertical redistribution. And so, you know, it was apparent that their response, that this thin layer um, is dispersed in response to the arrival of a very specific scattering layer. So we wanted to look at a little bit more of the taxonomic. Um, information for these scattering layers. So we did this through acoustic frequency differencing. So looking at the difference in mean volume backscattering from the 120 high frequency to the 38 low frequency. And so in a crude sense, that provides information on individual animal sizes of those scatterers. And so here's that early scattering layer. And you see their distribution here in that delta M, uh, MVBS value it indicates that they're likely so plankton. They're likely small and hard body, a lot of them. And this deeper layer coming through um, is likely larger individuals. And anecdotally uh, from the imaging information, it's likely micronectin fishes. And so in summary of these um, results, uh, we were able to record this really dense aggregation of the squat lobster, Pleurocodes planippes, that met the criteria for a thin layer. Uh, they reached their maximum density at their midday distribution, and uh, they were occupying this locally stratified isopycnal, tracking this isopycnal that, that had an internal wave oscillating through it. And it was, um, and they, this thin layer rapidly dispersed upon the arrival of a specific deep migrating layer. And we saw that they did this through this rapid escape response uh, that was very short lived. And um, we also saw that during that time, it looked like the fine scale stratification in that zero to 220 meter depth band um, was diminished. Um, and so in general, this, this findings kind of really speak to um, other studies that show these really critical time windows existing around dusk where there's this really pronounced but ephemeral um, changes to ecosystem structure in the Appian mesopelagic. And that's what we're seeing here with these crabs. Um, occupying this thin layer, rapidly dispersing, and um, apparently reforming uh, roughly two and a half hours later. <laughs>
And so I, again, I throw some lingering objectives. I have all this 3D information from the individual crab. So it'd be neat to kind of uh, tease out some more of their information on how they are aggregated. And we also have some other deployments where we captured uh, a dense aggregation of the squat lobster. And so I'd like to do a, uh, to look at those data sets as well. With that, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank my lab mates, Dave and Chris, my collaborators, Karen, uh, Wisher and Brennan Phillips at URI and my funding sources. Thanks for coming.